Thank you for listening to another episode of the War on the Rocks podcast series. I'm sitting here with uh, two Marks, Mark Riebling and Mark Stout. Uh, Mark Riebling is the author of the new book, Church of Spies. He's a historian and policy analyst. This is about the Pope's secret war against Hitler, and there's a really exciting new story to be told there. We're also joined by Mark Stout, who's a senior editor here at War on the Rocks, and he also directs the Intelligence Studies program at Johns Hopkins University here in uh, Washington, D.C., and he's a former analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department. This is actually a really fascinating book, and before I sort of mostly turn it on over to you two, I want to hear, Mark, what made you want to write this book? I was raised Catholic, and one of the things I learned was that if I expressed a kind of heterodox idea that the nuns could always souse me out because they had a really awesome informant system. So uh, I didn't think it was too uh, incredible or un unlikely when uh, I later read in the work of another scholar that the Vatican ran the world's oldest and perhaps best intelligence service. So this was something that I kind of had been thinking about for a, a long while. And in the process of writing my last book, I was able to come in contact with some people in the intelligence community who had been involved in penetrating the Vatican during World War II when we uh, occupied Rome in 1944 and 1945. And based on some of the things that were said to me by these sources, I developed a strong opinion that a lot of what had been written about Pope Pius XII, his silence during the Shoah, the attitudes of the institutional church and of this pope toward Hitler were not so much incorrect, but very incomplete. And that there was two stories here. One was above the line, what was visible in public, and there was another story untold below the line. And that's a story that interested me, and that's a story which I've decided to tell in Church of Spies. So your book is about two subjects which are both independently um, famously difficult to research, namely intelligence and espionage and the Vatican. So since you and I are both historians, I can't resist with starting. How do you know what you know? What kind of sources are available and what sort of challenges or issues did you face in actually being able to ferret out this really very detailed, um, in, a, in, a, in a good way, nu nuanced and gripping uh, story? The truth is that in order to study this in intelligence service, I really kind of had to develop almost an intelligence service of my own with informants and I wouldn't say moles within the Vatican, but I... I treated it with a certain amount of respect and reserve. I understood that this was an institution that had been around for 2,000 years. And although they have archives, which are theoretically open to scholars, you don't just walk into the Vatican and spend even two or three weeks in the archives and think that you're going to know really much of anything. It, it, I would compare it, you know, I'm from New York City, but I'd compare it there to, let's say you're a journalist and you want to write about, I don't know, the mafia. You don't go down to Carmine Street and knock on a door and expect to, to get access. And this is a closed community in the same way. So what you do want to do is establish that you are very knowledgeable and trustworthy because you've done your homework and, and you've spent your time. And there was a fellow, um, Ray Rocca, who went on to become head of the CIA counterintelligence research staff. He was under James Angleton. As he was under call. James Angleton, that's right, for 20 some odd years. And uh, he was very helpful to me at the beginning of this project because he had been one of the people responsible for trying to penetrate the Vatican in 1944-45 and even after the war. And he said, you have to take an Aristotelian approach. What he meant by that was whenever Aristotle talks about a subject, he reviews everything that had been done by people who worked before him. And he figures out the problems and the patterns. And he figures out where he's going to apply his resources. And that, that's what I did. Uh, eventually, I was able, rather than having to show up at the knock on the door of the Vatican... I, I developed relationships with people. I worked through intermediaries because I figured out that's how the Vatican itself prefers to work, through intermediaries so that it won't be exposed, through cutouts, as it were. And um, over time, I found that these cutouts could say, well, we have a document on this, but I, it's embargoed. I can't share it with you. Or we have a document on this meeting in 1943, and here I'll read it to you. So over time, by simply putting in a lot of work, a lot of sweat equity, I guess, I was able to develop um, sources. Okay, so you alluded to the... Uh, controversial nature of Pope Pius XII. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I want to sort of end with that. But let's just start with this. What was it about Hitler and the Third Reich that unambiguously did bother Pope Pius XII that motivated to get him into this uh, clandestine and covert war against, uh, against the Fuhrer? Well, the inciting incident was really the invasion of Poland in uh, September 1939, 
during which the SS spy chief, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, launched a campaign to exterminate that segment of the Polish intelligentsia, which posed the greatest threat from a sort of counterinsurgency perspective, and that was the Catholic clergy. So they shot several hundred priests outright in the first month of the invasion, and they sent two or three thousand more to Dachau, a concentration camp, where a good amount of them died. So Pius XII, at that point, although he was publicly neutral because that's the Vatican's official policy to stay neutral in wars, that was not his real policy. That was his, his public posture. But behind the scenes, he was convinced that you know, Hitler was totally evil and even tried to remotely exercise his soul at midnight from the Vatican apartments. Well, that didn't work. And so when Pius XII was approached by the German resistance around October 16th, 1939, and the segment of the German military intelligence under Admiral Canaris, the leader of German military intelligence, he, representing a certain faction of dissident generals in Germany, wanted to end the war early, get rid of Hitler, and do a deal with the British and with the Allies to try and have a, a peace before things got too out of hand. And at that point, Pius XII was highly motivated for reasons even deeper than Poland, but because he saw Hitler as basically the Antichrist and certainly a pagan, like the church hadn't seen since the times of Nero, he was uh, motivated to take this extraordinary leap and act as an intermediary between uh, Hitler's would-be assassins and the Chamberlain government in London. Well, that's something that's really striking. So as early as the fall of 1939, so the war has only just started, Mm -hmm. the Pope has decided that he is going to help get Hitler assassinated. I mean, this is a 20th century Pope. This is really quite dramatic. Mm -hmm. That's Uh, right. That's right, it is. It's something you're used to hearing about maybe with the Renaissance Pope. Sure, that's totally okay, right. right. Yeah. So one of the issues that's been salient in, in, in other contexts in our you know, current uh, you know, sort of national security world is varying Islamic traditions and what they say about overthrowing unjust or un-Islamic rulers. Um, and I was interested to see in your book that between the Lutherans, who are a big hunk of the German population, and the Catholics, who are also a big hunk of the German population, that there are sort of different traditions and different conclusions on this. So can you talk about... Sort of what it is that made the, at least sort of the believing Lutheran Germans a little reticent to uh, to do this sort of thing, and on what basis the Pope and uh, you know was able to justify not just justify but actively support uh, assassination efforts. What are those two different diverging schools of thought there, and how did that play out? Well, that's a, a great question, and I hope I can I can address it in like under five minutes. And you're not a theologian, <laughs> right? right. So. But I, I did um, work for a number of years after 9-11 um, as a research director at the Center for Policing Terrorism, and I was involved there in trying to get the NYPD to work with other, I'll well, say, three-letter agencies in trying to get local police to track jihadists. And you know, one of the things I learned is that the texture of the belief, as you point out, is very important. Uh, and so with regard to um, Luther, he had a different interpretation of Romans 13, which says, you know, all power is from God, all authority is from God, therefore we have to obey the authority above us. And it was actually kind of precisely for these reasons that the Catholic Church didn't want the average person reading the Bible, because they didn't want people taking things uh, you know, out of context or giving an interpretation that would be extremely inconvenient or or politically um, problematic. And we see this with Islam where um, the Shia have a hierarchy and the Sunnis don't. So there's a, a, a rough analogy with Catholicism and, and Lutheranism, but basically the Lutherans, there's a famous quote by Luther that says, I would rather see a prince doing wrong than the people doing right. Disobedience is a worse sin than murder. So since most of the German military uh, was Lutheran, they were sort of at a loss. And one of the things that they asked their intermediaries to do was for, for the Pope to give them a, case, a moral case for the doctrine of tyrannicide, which on the Catholic side was pretty well advanced by Thomas Aquinas and by Jesuit theologians, but it was very well it codified. It reminds me a little bit of you know how bin Laden thought he was doing all the right things. Well, we gave the warning, we did this, we did that, so now we're justified. There are some symmetries there, and what I would say is that it became very useful in this high-stress situation of Nazi Germany, where everyone was really afraid and everyone was really intimidated, to have a kind of diamond-hard doctrine which said, yes, you know, you can assassinate a head of state under certain conditions. And this was one of the quiet contributions, but a very real contribution that the Vatican made during these plots. So the, the Vatican is involved in both espionage against the Nazis, mm-hmm. and also in supporting you know, efforts to overthrow uh, or kill 
uh, Hitler? Were they using the same networks there, or were there a, a bunch of different threads leading out sort of at the organizational level? What does this look like? Because the, um, uh, you know, the, the German opposition isn't necessarily, you know, holding big, huge conventions. Uh, That's right. So they're not yeah. necessarily organized, and the Vatican doesn't per se have an intelligence service, even if they perform many of those sorts of functions. So how did this all get wired together? Well, the, the, the first part of the question, the answer is uh, yes, they were the same network, and the assassination um, conduits and uh, connection channels were built on the backs of or used the same arteries of communication that the Vatican had used to bring intelligence from this, uh, what was really to the Vatican, in many ways, a denied area of Nazi Germany before the war, uh, let's say from 1933 to 1939. And this, here's one of the reasons why a lot of people criticize the church. They did a deal with Hitler in 1933. The future Pope, Pius XII, he was then Eugenio Pacelli, Secretary of State. Pope Pius XI, the current Pope, said, let's protect church rights. Let's do a treaty with Hitler that guarantees church rights. So they signed this. Well, then, right away, Hitler, being Hitler, started violating it right and left. How are we going to prove that they're violating it? We need evidence of the violations of this treaty. But, of course, uh, Nazis control all channels of communication, phone, mail, travel. So the church, because it had was an international global body, had people who could be line crossers and without arousing suspicion. In one case, really the hero of my book is this uh, Bavarian uh, lay agent. He's a you know German lawyer. Joseph Mueller, he had the nickname Achsenzep, or Joey Ox, and he took the secrets and flew them over the Alps in a single-engine sports plane and landed in Murano, turned them over to a clergyman, and they went to uh, Pius XII's or Pacelli's uh, apartment in Rome, where they were stored in a big red book with a carved-out inside hollow hiding space in the top shelf of his uh, private library. So this network um, was pre-existing, and when the German military asked, um, they needed a way to contact the Vatican. They, they knew that they had a file on Joey Ox because um, he, his sympathies with the Vatican were well known. So they, they called him, and he thought, he thought, gee, my number's really up now. I'm going to get beheaded. So the Abwehr, the, the intelligence service, or one of the intelligence services, called him in for a meeting, and he the thought, thought called, he's in trouble. Exactly, in the end of September 1939. And instead, it's completely flipped. They say, we're trying to kill Hitler. Will you help us? Will you help us uh, recruit the Pope into this plot? So, so he said yes. And I would just make, as a, as a footnote to that, some people might say, well, was this really espionage, or was it just information gathering, Right. And I think if you look at it, the whole thing together, it is definitely gathering secret intelligence, using clandestine means, using a courier system. You can call it what you want, but it was it was church spying. And, you know, not having a formal intelligence service can actually be helpful. Uh, and it's informal trust networks, uh, secret social networks, if you will, of highly motivated people who trust each other with their lives. You don't always need a bureaucracy to engage in these kind of activities. Yeah, and I believe you talk in the book about, at one point about how they did have at least one or two what you would legitimately call clandestine sources. I think you refer to an officer in the SS, for instance, who's giving them secret information from inside the SS bureaucracy. It's not just sort of watching what's going on around the, the Reich and its occupied territory. That's right. He was an informant. His name was Hans Rottenhuber. And for the conspirators, he had a, a particularly valuable uh, position because he was the head of Hitler's bodyguard. So if you're trying to kill Hitler and one of your sources is the head of Hitler's bodyguard, this was very helpful. And another one who's just sort of colorful was uh, uh, a, a woman named Sister Pia Bauer. She wasn't really a nun, but she styled herself a kind of Nazi nun. She was the only woman to march with Hitler during his Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, and she was wounded, and she would give information to Joey Ox, but the price was he had to go meet her in the side room of a bank and drink with her, and then she would lift up her skirt and show the scar she'd received on her buttocks from being injured in Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch. So she was this kind of legendary harpy, but who was very uh, willing to help if treated the right way, and she'd say, well, yes, you know, we've arrested Father so-and-so, they're looking at Father this and I would that. just like to interrupt yes. and say for the listeners at home, Mark actually did mock lift up his dress which is not right and to, he like mined the my uh, jeans yeah his <laughs> jeans to to act that out for us but you didn't get the benefit of that sorry to interrupt <laughs> um so uh to what extent did was the vatican really actually pushing or enabling any of these assassination plots as opposed to merely um giving their blessing or failing to object i mean 
would it be a fair summarization summary of your book to say the Pope tried to kill Hitler, or rather that the Pope didn't stand in the way while good Catholics tried to kill Hitler? You know, that's a really, really good question, and I went back and forth on it. You know, I, I said to myself, you know, looking at the subtitle of the book, which is The Pope's Secret War Against Hitler, you know, that implies a kind of agency and ownership of the plots. And I said, well, it's fair in this sense. It, it wasn't only the Pope's Secret War Against Hitler, but by analogy, if people in the Ukraine or in Moscow came to Pope Francis and said, you know, we'd really like to have a regime change. We'd like to get rid of Putin. Will you go to President Obama and help us? Will you be the intermediary? Will you help arrange this? Will you be the cutout? Well, I, I, you know, would it be too much to say it's Pope Francis' secret war against Putin? At a certain point, if he's operationally involved and he's having midnight meetings uh, with American diplomats in his apartment to arrange the terms of, uh, you know, make sure that it's not going to be a nuclear war and there's this and that's not going to happen. You know, it, the involvement of the Pope was fairly granular in all these matters. And in chapter one of the book, I talk about how the Pope engaged in things like having Jesuits make secret tapes of his meetings. So, so we know a lot of what uh, the Pope said uh, about Hitler and how he formed his policy toward Hitler. Because, as, as an aside, do those yes. recordings still exist? Well, that's one of the things I'm trying to find out. We had the transcripts and the Jesuit who was in charge of Pius XII's beatification said... We probably have the tapes somewhere because we never throw anything away, but I haven't been able to find the actual tapes. They were probably made on this ribbon steel that was so fragile, or over time, they transferred it to another medium. So I don't think they have the original wire recordings. All right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, was, it was a, a tremendously you yeah. know, dramatic and fascinating bit of the book. It's, you know, it's, it's Richard Nixon's recording system, except it it's in the Pope's office, for crying out loud. So this is a Pope who's very granular in terms of his um, telling the cardinals and the Popes how, how to engage in clandestine activities, down to the point of telling them which hostile in Munich courier should stay at and how they should skim the Peter's Pence, the um, charitable book contributions from German Catholics, how they can skim money from that to pay for the courier service. So at that level, he was definitely pushing uh, a covert a line of action. And the, and the reason he was pushing covert policy resistance toward Hitler is that he believed, and I think there's a case that he was right about this, that at this point in time, nationalism was such the ideology and such the, the mood of, the, of the, all of Europe, really, that if German Catholics were forced to choose between between being Germans or Catholics, they would have chose to be Germans first. And the Pope Pius XII was really worried about a schism like happened under Henry VIII in England, a breakaway church. With, If you think about it from the Pope's point of view, millions and millions of souls lost because they won't get access to the sacraments. So this was his motivation for resist resisting in secret and not having an open break. But to your question about to what extent he pushed it, we do know that in... Um, February 1943, he had a meeting with Joey Ox, the uh, assassin's intermediary, in which the issue was discussed, is it okay, can we put a, we're going to put a bomb on, his, on Hitler's plane? And um, the Pope expressed himself in favor of this, according to Joseph Mueller. So at a number of points, we have something like, you could say, the, postulate the following. Though certain things were um, occurred without the Holy Father's knowledge, nothing was done by the Catholic conspirators which were against his expressed wishes. And so we have in letters from the Jesuits, they'd ask themselves, well, what would Pius XII have me do? And then they would say, I'll report this to Rome, and if he disagrees, let him overrule me. So there was a sort of de facto control exercised in that way. How, if at all, does all of this connect to uh, you know, the big story about World War II, which involves you know, the Americans and the British and their military and intelligence efforts? Is this self-contained? I'd say there's two, um, there's two answers to that. One is that there was a kind of shadow war that was fought in the neutral countries. One of the other places, of course, was Alan Dulles in Switzerland. It was a, a real happy hunting ground for spies because it was a neutral country. The Spain, Portugal, and, of course, the Vatican City was especially valuable because it was right in the heart of fascist Europe. It was right in the middle of uh, the Zenaida area of Italy. So uh, Allied diplomats could come and go to and from Vatican City during the war, which was really kind of extraordinary. And so that was helpful. But in another way, I think, you know, people have called Pius XII Hitler's pope because he um, was not openly uh, against Hitler during the, the Reich. But I think it, it really, if you look at what Pius actually did, he was much more uh, Churchill's and Roosevelt's pope because he was in contact with both the Washington and London with regard to German regime change and really encouraged it. 
There was, if you just bring in the other piece of it, uh, Stalin, this is important because Pius XII, being a traditional Catholic, was very anti-communist. And he did not want a post-war European order in which Stalin had a lot to say in Central Europe. So Pius XII liked and the German... Stalin's derision for the Catholic Church was well known. We're going to, I think, maybe end with that, but yeah. Sure. And, and so the point being that the, the German military would have greatly preferred a separate peace with the West, right? And in a certain extent, they saw this as even a way of dividing the alliance, especially after um, Hitler had uh, invaded Russia in 1941. And by the end of the year, the war wasn't going well. So the idea of a separate peace was very appealing to the German generals and to the Vatican. So in other words, Germany surrenders to the West, but keeps intact its assets for maybe even a, a joint attack against, against Stalin in the East. Now, this was wishful thinking on the part of the conservatives in Europe, but there were those within both uh, the British government and the American government who would have actually liked to have seen this. I know Alan Dulles is one. So if, if I understood what I read in your book, uh, the church passed on warnings of, I believe, the German invasion of the Benelux countries and also of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union in 1941. Did either of those warnings make any difference? I mean, both of those came as surprises. Right. But to the extent you can tell from your research, were these warnings taken seriously? Did they actually factor into the considerations of the of the Allies, or was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. What is the you know? What do a bunch of priests know? Well, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, you're a, a student of uh, intelligence history, and if you can point to me a case where a warning was ever taken seriously before the fact, well, uh, that, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure there are, we, we, but there there you could probably count them on one hand. Uh, certainly, in the 20th century. The short answer is is no, they weren't taken seriously. It was uh, a signal which was not totally differentiated from the noise. But it is true that after the fact, um, especially after uh, Hitler invaded the West on May 10th, 1940, the Vatican and its connections with the German resistance had a lot of credibility because they were proven right. And they also warned about the invasion of Norway uh, in April 1940. And the Vatican was the um, first major power to understand and really have uh, justified true belief that Hitler was going to invade Russia. And this came as early as um, October 1940. So, um, so that was good reporting. It was solid. It came through Joey Ox, who had his contacts in the Abwehr. And um, it was, I, I would stress that this, this was warning London in, as in particular was really an act that violated the Pope's stance of neutrality. Because if you're, if you're warning another neutral country, you could say, all right, well, that's not necessarily an act of war. But, but warning a party to aligned in the war like uh, France or Britain, that, that really was something. And based on this, I believe that London actually warned, warned Stalin. He didn't take it seriously sure. that they were going to invade. Well, just a comment and then just two last quick questions. I mean, one of the things that really strikes me uh, reading your book and talking with you is as, as you look at all the clandestine trade craft here, as you talk about, for instance, uh, you know, skimming the, 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 the donations at church to pay for some of the courier networks and, and that sort of thing is, despite the fact that the church doesn't per se have an intelligence service, um, you know, form follows function, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're facing the same sorts of clandestine problems that the CIA or, you know, any other intelligence service does. And ultimately, they come to basically the same sorts of answers, even though they don't have, you know, this bureaucracy and this sort of tradition of we have an intelligence service that does things this way. This is a quick last question or two. Um, so, you, and you alluded to this at the beginning, you know, we're all familiar with this reputation that Pope Pius XII has in a lot of circles is, you know, not having, you know, stood up against Hitler, uh, you know, as, as an undergrad far too many years ago, I, I was, uh, had to read uh, Rolf Hochut's uh, 1960s uh, play, The Deputy. Um, you referred it to the book, uh, Hitler's Pope. Um, how do you know, ultimately taking all this into account, and you, you mentioned, you know, he doesn't really stand up and publicly speak against the Holocaust. What ultimately is your bottom line view of Pius XII more in sort of a politico-moral sort of sense? Well, he wasn't Hitler's pope, but he wasn't Anne Frank's pope either. And I think that judging it by today, it's clear that he, he should have spoken out. He should have cried it from the mountaintop. But he, I think, was very influenced by what the German resistance was telling him. And in their first approach, in October 1939, they said, please don't speak out. This will expose uh, resistance elements in Germany to persecution, surveillance. It will make us much harder to do what we're trying to do. And we know from uh, documents in the um, FDR library 
that this was the story from beginning to the very end in 1945, June 1945. A U.S. Uh, charged affairs in the Vatican uh, writes to Roosevelt saying, well, I asked, why didn't the Pope denounce Hitler by name during the war? The question wasn't about speaking out for the Jews, it was about speaking against Hitler, which is really what the Allies wanted. And he and um, the, the Joey Ox, who had made it through this incredible odyssey alive, to the end said, well, you know, we, told, we, asked, we asked the Pope not to speak out, and he didn't. So um, I think it was clearly a moral mistake, but he was guided by practical considerations, and he, I think, felt very torn between his role as a moral spokesman, a moral leader, but also his um, leader of the church and to shepherd 800 million souls to salvation. He felt he, could, he had a choice between lives and souls, and he went with souls, he tried to save Catholic souls, and this was a conflict, and he had to cut the Gordian knot as best he could by trying to kill Hitler.